it's very important here to be to be to begin to think about money it's very important to get to the price um, it's important to quantify the delivery of the technology in terms of money and even if it seems an arbitrary choice at an early stage and this is this is what um, one of the things that I'll, I'll be talking about from now on um, how to get to this price it it is very, very important to do so, um, and I hope this will emerge um, as we go along. Once you have a price, once you begin to think of everything in terms of costs and revenue, you can, you can begin to nail down the relationship between fixed costs, marketing costs, operating costs, and the revenue. And through a number of iterations, you can improve. It's very important to do this, and the main point is not that you will get the right um, price or you, you will assess the, the different costs and, and revenues correctly the first time. The main point is that you will begin to see how they hang, how they all are part of a piece. It's this thing, getting yourself to see the costs and the revenues as a part of a uh, the greater picture is what it's about. It, it's wrong at first, it necessarily, because it's so difficult to do, so you be, be out by, by orders of magnitude, you should still do it. It's very, very difficult for, for scientists and engineers to do when your orders of magnitude out. It seems to be nonsensical to, to do, some, do a calculation that is orders of magnitude out. But the point is not the, the, the correctness of the number. The, the purpose is to begin to think from a greater perspective. I'm repeating myself deliberately here. It's, it's really to, to, to focus in on this issue that we're, we're talking about iteration, where you um, all the time relate market technology and implementation to each other. And when things go well, it gets better all the time. It gets closer, in, uh, if you want, and you will arrive at, a, at an innovation. It can, of course, also go wrong, and it never works. But um, if it goes well, then you arrive at an, at an innovation at, at some point in time. Um, and I'm, I'm really just trying to flag up what we're doing here. Um, and, and the point is to get you as close to the innovation experience as possible. Um, and this iteration that, that, that we keep talking about is crucial, but it's very, very hard to teach um, for a number of reasons. Um, but, but mostly the people who've been through the experience um, forget many of the iterations. Um, and they start to, to develop um, linear narratives of, uh, that, that list a progress um, we we have a, a tendency to forget about the many little failures and, and dead ends that we go into and so they tend to disappear from the historical record and, and that makes it really hard to teach. Also it can be really tedious sometimes to, um, to, to hear about something that has an enormous amount of dead ends. Uh, so the audience also doesn't want to hear the stories that really talk about the, the tough parts which are the, the, the dead ends and the, the wasted time and the wasted effort or well should we say not wasted because you learn a lot from it but, but not, not linear things that in retrospect you can see were a waste of time so this is one of the main points of the, of the lecture to try to, to make the iteration of the dead ends, the surprises, the difficulties of, of doing stuff. That's what I'm trying to do here. Um, one of the things, one of the main things, I would say the other main thing is um, the calculation, getting to a, a, a sense of the, the relationship between costs and revenues um, and how that makes you focus on the right things. Those two things are, are the, the main issues in this uh, lecture from now on. Now let's um, start with a, um, a useful calculation. 
Um, and as I say, it doesn't really matter whether these numbers are right or wrong. That's not really the point. Uh, but the point is to have them all relate to each other and start to start to think about innovation in these terms. So with the building that we've been talking about above the, the radiological building at the hospital of uh, St. George in Hamburg, Germany, let's say, let's think about the fixed costs that you would have to sink into this project if you wanted to get this um, radiological department going. So you would have to build a building and let's say that costs you a million dollars and then you would have to um, do sales and marketing to convince doctors that this is a useful thing. That might be much more. Um, so let's say that's ten million dollars. And let's think about the running costs, the annual running costs. You'd have to pay salaries to the staff, to the um, uh, assistant that I, we, we had in doing the actual work of the photography. Uh, there's a cost of el electricity, an annual cost, and there's a maintenance of the building, this might be administration and so on. Um, so that adds up to, what, just over $11 million. And on that, you might calculate that you could get an annual revenue for the service of providing the X-ray photographs of, say, $600,000. This might be wrong, this might be right, but let's just see. If, if these numbers were accurate, then it would take uh, roughly 20 years to break even. So you sink the capital in, $11 million, and it would take you about 20 years to get $11 million out. 20, million, 20, 20 years to break even. That's too long for any kind of investment. Um, so if these numbers are right, then the whole thing doesn't make sense. So we need to have some changes in this calculation for it to make sense. Something's got to happen for this X-ray technology in its form of a centralized radiological department to make sense. And to remind you, there are several, several places where this could happen. You know, we could have improved vacuum tubes, which would make for better diagnosis, which would convince more doctors, which would make for a larger market, and that way we could have more money for development technology and implementation of better diagnosis. We could have a, a virtuous circle going up like this. So, so these kinds of iterations are clear, right? You can keep improving the technology, the vacuum tube, the high voltage supply, you can keep improving the implementation, the convenience, the division of labor, the organization of throughput, and you can keep improving the market, uh, convincing more medical specialties. So in some ways, it seems easy and simple. Um, you just keep improving these numbers until you, you, you arrive at something. But, and this is the second theme that, that I want to focus on now just how difficult this is so let's move on to some of that so if we imagine that 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 you're a, a, a an x-ray entrepreneur at the time you have to keep an eye on the relevant developments and obviously the thing to do is to read relevant journals, which would be scientific magazines such as Nature or the Archives of the Rentgen Ray or medical uh, journals such as the British Medical Journal or engineering journals such as the Electrical Review. Um, these are all British uh, uh, newspapers, so you, we're now imagining that you, you are in Britain at the time. Uh, you would have to talk to relevant people uh, you'd have to talk to electricians, instrument makers, medical doctors, health insurance experts. And the problem that I want to flag up here is that when you are in a startup company, you're trying to innovate, it's actually really hard to know what's relevant. Afterwards, well, with 2020 vision, it's really easy to know what was relevant. But when you're living through it, it's very hard. And with the next couple of slides, I want to play a game and have you sort of try to imagine what is relevant. And the point is just to make you 
realize just how hard it is. So there were many different uh, terms, and I mean, I'm, this is this is just like nowadays. If you if you want to learn about a subject, you you would one of the things that you would do is to Google it or do a, a search engine uh, a search. And then you have to know which terms you have to search for. And the problem is that terms often change and different people use different terms. And so it's really hard to know what you should be searching for. And the search engine doesn't know. Um, and these are, uh, are some terms that were, were used in, in the early days of x-rays. And, and I mean, I, I know from the context that these are terms for um, x-ray related activities um, but if you look at them you wouldn't know that it's it's really not clear from the words themselves that these are talking about the same technology that's a problem especially if you're um, charged with keeping track of what is relevant if you don't know what words people are using how do you know what's relevant and now let's take some of the topics that were um, talked about. Here's, and we're going through some years. And let's start with 1896. Um, there were articles saying that X-rays can be polarized, reflected, refracted, and diffracted. But there were also articles that said they could not. Um, you know, this this is very much um, in the realm of physics. People were trying to figure out. What is the nature of X-rays? What are these things? And and they they seem certainly in some ways to be very much like visible light. I mean, you can take photographs with them. So, do they behave like light in other ways? And and what what you can do with light is you can polarize it, reflect it, refract and diffract it. So, in in research in this sense was about you know, trying to figure out what what are these things. The the name X-rays incidentally was chosen because you know, X for unknown. It, these were rays, but what kind of rays were they? That was the, the point of the name. Um, another article was that glowworms emit X-rays. Um, there was an article that blind people can see X-rays. Um, an article saying there are four different kinds of cathode rays. An article saying solar rays contain no X-rays. Another that X-rays have no germicidal action. And one saying that X-ray intensity falls off with 1 over R squared, where R is the distance from the um, anti-cathode in the X-ray tube. What's relevant here? Um, and this is still 1896. There was a physicist in Nancy, in France, who discovered invisible N-rays, uh, invisible rays, which he called N-rays from Nancy. There was one in Paris who discovered invisible rays that were called black radiation. There was an article saying dermatitis was caused by uh, Röntgen rays. So uh, Röntgen rays is another word for X-rays. So the X-rays caused, caused an affliction of the skin. Um, a chemist in Paris discovered that some salts fog photographic plates. And there's an article that a Wimshurst machine is better suited to providing high voltage than an induction coil. So Wimshurst is basically a wheel that you have magnets on and then you crank the wheel and uh, that can generate a current. We're still in 1896, so X-rays were used to analyze Dürer paintings. Dürer is a, a, an artist, a German artist from the early modern period. X-rays were used to analyze welds in, in metals and the effect of corsets on human bodies. Another article um, described that hands exposed to X-rays feel cold. Uh, one used X-rays to alleviate pleurisy, as it said. Um, another article described curious skin reactions. Um, many articles talked about electric baths replenishing patients' energy. 
and there were also articles that claimed that x-rays do the same. Really thinking about the human body as a battery. Um, there were articles where medical doctors um, feared um, x-ray malpractice, so um, being sued for malpractice. Um, it was argued that x-rays are electrical rather than a form of light and that x-rays influence the spark gap itself that we were talking about earlier and x-rays and Becquerel rays the, the salts close to um, the, 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 the chemist who discovered the salts in, impacted photographic plates that I mentioned in a previous slide that chemist was Becquerel and we now call it radioactive rays. So, you know, from our perspective, X-rays and radioactive rays both discharge electrified metal plates, but it, they're called Becquerel rays at the time. And this slide, um, I think I'll just read this in. Um, there seems to be no doubt that the X-rays can produce some very curious effects on the skin. There have been several authentic cases reported, some of which I, and this is Henry Augustus Rowland, actually I'll say something about him in a minute, some of which I have myself seen. It is not quite certain, however, that this effect is an unmixed one, for in every case the affected skin has been in contact with other things in the rays, as, for instance, with platinocyanides, and other substances used in preparing the screens. It has, it has also been noted that those who have done most fluorescent work are the most affected. So until all other possible causes can be eliminated, it would be rash to draw conclusions. That these lesions are the effect of the x-rays alone must appear somewhat doubtful. And let me just, uh, before I say something about Rowland, um, I just realized that maybe I have not been very clear about the f uh, fluorescent screens and the photographic plates. But, but here's, the, here's the thing, both, both were used. So you have an x-ray tube and then you send the rays through some part of the body like the hand. And then on the other hand you have either a fluorescent screen or a photographic plate. If you have a fluorescent screen you can see the image immediately and you don't need to develop a, f a photographic plate but you also need um, much higher intensity of x-rays so yeah and you don't have a record you can you can expose for maybe seconds or minutes well early on it would be half an hour later it'd be minutes and then by 1915 it would be just seconds or one second and then you can um, accumulate the radiation onto the photographic screen and get an image that way which you then can have as a um, um, as a as a record and some of these quotes here talk about screens some of them talk about photographic plates but it's it, both were used and increasingly the having a record was of more issue and so the, the screens went away. But early on, people were working very much with fluorescent screens and not photographic plates. Okay, all right. Now, Henry Rowland, Henry Augustus Rowland, I just wanted to mention, um, uh, especially if you're at MIT, in Andover, uh, Massachusetts, there's um, a, muse a museum at the Phillips Academy where there's a, a, a painting of Henry Augustus Rowland which is, the, the frame is very interesting. It has many, um, you know, it's a wooden frame, but in the, in the frame itself there are many um, schematic drawings that look very much like, like the schematic drawings I, I showed you early on. Um, and um, many, many um, bits and pieces that, that relate to the topic that we're talking about here. So, you know, if you have a have a free weekend, uh, do go to the Phillips Academy and, and check out the museum and the, the really splendid um, uh, painting of Henry Augustus Rowland. Okay, but, but one of the things that, that I want to flag up here is that there's something about the impact of the x-rays on the human body that is beginning to be, be, become clear 
um, although the quote sh shows very clearly that you know may maybe this is wrong. Um, so again, in, in terms of our question is what what is relevant? It's really hard to know whether this is relevant or not. Very hard. Afterwards, now with 2020 hindsight, we know this is hugely relevant, and we know that. A tremendous amount of damage was done to human bodies, uh, but at the time it wasn't clear that, that this was even relevant. Mm -hmm.